Hello everyone, welcome to this lecture on uh, gauge invariance. This lecture is part of uh, module 4 of your electrodynamics course. This uh, is the plan of uh, this particular lecture. We shall first begin by uh, exploring an inconsistency in uh, Ampere's law and uh, that will be followed by uh, the correction which was made by Maxwell and that is why we do not call it Ampere's law anymore, we call it as the Ampere Maxwell's law. Then uh, we will introduce uh, the notion of uh, scalar and vector uh, fields. Uh, you are already familiar with uh, the scalar uh, electric potential and the vector potential. So, we will uh, introduce the notion of these two potentials and then uh, we will reduce the Maxwell's equations to uh, two inhomogeneous uh, equations uh, in these uh, scalar and vector uh, potential fields. Then uh, we would try to uh, simplify the situation, simplify these uh, uh, inhomogeneous equations using a uh, special kind of a transformation known as a gauge transformation. And finally, we will have a look at uh, two specific gauge transformations. Uh, one is the Coulomb gauge, another one is the Lorentz gauge. Okay, so first coming to the inconsistency in Ampere's law. So, uh, the laws which govern the electric and magnetic fields in steady state are uh, the four laws. First one is uh, the Gauss law, the Coulomb Gauss law, which states that the divergence of the electric uh, displacement is nothing but the charge density. Then <coughs> we have divergence of B equal to 0, there is no name for this law, we just call it as the absence of uh, free magnetic monopoles because this arises from the fact that uh, free magnetic monopoles cannot exist. So, as a result uh, if I have a magnetic field line which starts at one point and then it should uh, again come back to that same point. So, that means the divergence of uh, such a field will be 0. Then uh, the next law is the Faraday's law which basically relates the space derivative of electric field with the time derivative of the magnetic field. And finally, we have the Ampere's law which uh, tells us that the uh, curl of the magnetic intensity is nothing but the uh, current density. Or just simply, we can call it as this itself as the current because we are at the microscopic domain and this is what is called as the Ampere's law. So, now this is a basic uh, axiom of uh, vector calculus and it says that the divergence of the curl of any vector field is always 0. Okay. So, that, uh, this we need to keep in mind that is the divergence of the curl of any vector field okay, without any exception any vector field the divergence of the curl should always be 0. So, now H is a vector field right. So, if H is a vector field then the divergence of the curl of H also must be 0. Okay, so, curl of H, you take the curl of H and then you take the divergence, this must be 0 because of this uh, axiom of, uh, not, not axiom, this theorem of uh, in from vector calculus. Now, from uh, Ampere's law, okay, curl of H, it must be equal to divergence of, uh, curl of H must be equal to J and there is a divergence here, that means the divergence of J, it must be equal to 0. So, now we already uh, we have done what is known as a continuity equation uh, in the class uh, and what the continuity equation says it relates uh, the divergence of the uh, current density with the time derivative of the charge density. So, basically this is what the continuity equation looks like it says that the divergence of j plus dou rho by dou t it must be equal to 0. So, this was equation number 1, this we got it from, uh, from, from the fact that the divergence of curl of any vector field is always 0 and from the Ampere's law curl of H must be equal to J, so divergence of J is 0 and from the continuing equation divergence of J is equal to dou rho by dou t. So, from these two equations it, uh, we reach the conclusion that uh, the time partial time derivative of rho must be equal to 0. So, if the part time derivative of any quantity is 0, that means that quantity is constant with respect to time, which means rho as a function of time, it must be constant. So, if rho is constant with respect to time, that means we are talking about the steady state case or the static case. Okay. So, this uh, result, it uh, suggests that the Ampere's law is applicable only in the static case, because what will happen in the non-static case? 
नॉन स्टैटिक केस मीन्स रो ऑफ टी इज नॉट अ कॉन्स्टेंट तो इन दैट केस डोरो बाई डो टी विल बी नॉट जीरो इफ डोरो बाई डो टी इज नॉट जीरो डेट मीन्स डाइवर्जेंस ऑफ जे इज ऑल्सो नॉट जीरो इफ डाइवर्जेंस ऑफ जे इज नॉट जीरो डेट मीन्स डाइवर्जेंस ऑफ कर्ल ऑफ एच ऑल्सो विल नॉट बी जीरो विच विल वायोलेट दिस थियरम ऑफ वैक्टर कैलकुलस सो दिस एम्पियर्स लॉ दैट दीज कंक्लूजन दैट वी हैव ड्रॉन फ्रॉम एम्पियर्स लॉ इट इज ओनली वैलिड इन द केस ऑफ द स्टैटिक चार्जेस so what happens if uh, we are considering uh, the non steady case so uh, for that case uh, maxwell he applied a correction to the ampere's law okay so how did he do that he basically used the gauss law in uh, the continuity equation so again going back to the continuity equation divergence of j plus dot by dot equal to 0 and what does the gauss law say it says that the divergence of d is equal to rho d is the electric displacement so now all you need to do is this row instead of this row you just substitute uh, divergence of d in equation number 2 so divergence of j plus do by do t of instead of row we have divergence of d which is equal to 0 now this is a time derivative and this is a space derivative space and time are independent of each other so we can as well swap them so i can get the divergence out and i can take the do row by do t inside so this gives us divergence of j plus divergence of do d by do t it must be equal to 0 so now i can take the divergence common in this case and the moment i do that i get divergence of j plus do d by do t it is equal to 0 so this equation number 4 what it shows is um, divergence of j is definitely not zero in the non steady case but divergence it is not divergence of j which is zero at all times it is divergence of j plus this extra quantity which is going to be always zero because in the st static case okay this will be zero because uh, the electric field is going to be uh, constant with respect to time because the charges are also not changing so this will be zero so that means in that case we'll get divergence of j equal to zero which was what uh, which was the conclusion that we had drawn from the ampere's law but in case it's a non steady case then this will have some value but overall this con this condition will always be satisfied so this equation number 4 shows that it is the divergence of not j but rather it is the divergence of j plus do d by do t which is always zero so uh, maxwell he made the following replacement in the ampere's law okay so what he did was in ampere's law on the right hand side the j he replaced with j plus do d by do t so basically this was ampere's law curl of h was e, curl of h is equal to j okay so this ampere's law he modified it okay it was on the right hand side there was only j so what he did was to j he added this correction term which was do d by do t and uh, this took it on this side so this gives us the modified ampere's law and in uh, maxwell's honor this law we call it as the ampere maxwell's law so finally we have uh, these uh, set of four maxwell's equations okay these are the four maxwell's equations and in case of linear media linear media means uh, that um, this uh, uh, we could just replace this d with epsilon not e and uh, b is uh, b we can replace it with mu not h okay so with this in linear media what will happen is this is what we get okay the divergence of e is this divergence of b is this curl of e plus do b by do t is 0 and curl of uh, curl of b minus 1 by c square do e by do t is equal to mu not j so you can see here these are uh, four first order differential equations okay and out of these four first order differential equations the gauss law and the ampere maxwell's law these are in homogeneous equations but the absence of magnetic monopoles and the faraday's law these are homogeneous Uh, differential equations we can just how do you identify that just look and look at the right hand side so on the right hand side take all the differentials on the left hand side okay and whatever is left behind on the right hand side you just have a look if on the right hand side we have zeros then this is a homogeneous differential equation and here and here the right hand side it is not zero so this one and this one that is the gauss law and the ampere's maxwell's law these are the inhomogeneous first order differential equations Okay, so now uh, let's uh, get some kind of uh, get the notion of uh, scalar and uh, vector potentials from uh, the homogeneous uh, Maxwell's equations. That is from divergence of B and from this one. 
divergence of b is always zero which it always holds good because it's a fundamental property of matter okay you cannot have um, isolated magnetic monopole so divergence of b is always going to be equal to zero so if divergence of b is zero that means b we can write it as curl of a why again the same theorem that is the divergence of the curl of any vector quantity is uh, the divergence of the curl of any vector field will always be zero and since we are having divergence of b equal to zero that means b can be written as the curl of some vector field and since divergence of curl is always zero so that means curl that will ensure that the curl of b is also always zero so that means we can write down b as a curl of some other quantity that quantity let's call it as a but in the non static case okay in the non static case dou b by dou t is not going to be equal to zero okay so we are basically now moving into this equation the faraday's law in the non static case this will be non zero okay if this is non zero then that means curl of e is also equal is non zero okay so if curl of e is non zero then we cannot express the electric field as a gradient of some scalar field okay so uh, this actually helps us to distinguish between two kinds of fields so if the divergence of a field is zero as in the case of a magnetic field okay if the divergence is uh, zero then such fields are known as solenoidal fields okay and such solenoidal fields can be written as the curl of some other vector field but if the curl is zero curl of e is zero which is what happens in the electrostatic case if you remember in the electrostatics what do we do in electrostatic we just say that electric field is the negative gradient of electric potential okay but that is only in the static case because in that case what happens is the curl of e is zero and as a result we say that we can write down the electric field as a negative gradient because the curl of the gradient of some scalar field also will be always zero okay so such fields are known as um, irrotational field so electrostatic field in the static case electric field is irrotational but magnetic field is always solenoidal okay so in the non static case dou b by dou t is not zero so if dou b by dou t is not zero that means curl of e is also not zero so if curl of e is not zero then we cannot express e as the negative gradient of some scalar potential okay we cannot write down this equation so what do we do we again go back to the faraday's law okay in faraday's law we have curl of e equal to curl of e plus dou b by dou t is equal to zero now you take this b b is equal to curl of a you just substitute this over here okay so curl of e plus dou by dou t of curl of a which is equal to zero now once again this is a time derivative and this is a space derivative we can swap them because space and time they are independent of each other so i couldn't take this curl outside and the dou by dou t we can take it inside now we have two terms which have curls so i can as i can as well take the curl common so curl of e plus dou by dou t is equal to 0 so what we uh, understand from here is that the curl of e is not necessarily zero in the non in in, in non especially in the non static case the curl of e is not zero but the curl of e plus something else it will be always zero under all circumstances okay so if the curl of e plus something else is always zero that means this e plus this quantity this must be equal to some uh, gradient of some scalar okay so this e plus dou a by dou t this can be expressed as the negative gradient of some scalar field and that scalar field we can just call it as phi and so e plus dou a by dou t is equal to minus phi, uh, gradient of phi in the static case this will become zero and then that phi will be nothing but your our electric potential so the electric uh, and the magnetic fields they can be expressed in terms of the uh, potentials in this way we can find the electric field as negative gradient of phi minus negative time derivative of a and the magnetic field we can get it as the curl of a so this a and the phi okay we just call them as the potentials phi is the scalar potential and a is the vector potential so these two equations tell tell us that if you know these potentials you can find out the fields so how to find out the fields using the potentials this two equations will basically tell us okay so uh, what we have obtained here um, are uh, the notion of these two potentials the scalar and the vector potential we have obtained the notion of these two 
but how do they change what is the behavior how do these uh, two potentials how do they behave with time that means we are interested in the dynamic behavior of phi and a how do we obtain the dynamic behavior of the phi and a the dynamic behavior we can get it from the inhomogeneous maxwell's equations so remember maxwell's equations how many are there there are four maxwell's equations out of these four maxwell's equations two are homogeneous these two homogeneous maxwell's equations give us the notion of these potentials and the other two the remaining two which are inhomogeneous maxwell's equations they will tell us about the dynamic behavior of this phi and a okay all right so now <coughs> from gauss law we have divergence of e is equal to rho by epsilon or this is the first uh, inhomogeneous maxwell's equation which is gauss law so e what we do is we replace e with its uh, expression in terms of phi and a so e is equal to minus grad phi minus do a by do t which is equal to rho by epsilon naught so now uh, <coughs> uh, divergence of gradient is nothing but your laplacian right and uh, this minus sign i can just take it here so both of these will become plus and here we'll get a minus sign so divergence of gra gradient will will be nothing but a laplacian and uh, again this divergence is a space derivative this is a time derivative i can take the time derivative out and i can associate this space derivative with a which will give us the divergence of a so this is our equation number 8 and again the this is the second uh, inhomogeneous maxwell's equation okay which is curl of b minus 1 by c square do a by do t is equal to mu not j so here again we'll do the, we'll follow the same procedure like in this case here we have substituted a in e in terms of phi and a here also we'll do the same thing we'll substitute e in terms of phi and a and of course there is a b here and that b will be will substitute with curl of a okay so this b instead of b we just put a curl of a here and instead of e we write it as minus grad phi minus do a by do t everything else remains the same okay so now uh this curl of curl of a this is the standard result okay the uh, curl of curl of any vector field you can just refer to the first chapter of uh, uh, dj griffiths okay you will find this formula curl of curl of a is nothing but the grad derivative of a minus the laplacian of a and uh, this uh, here what we do is uh, again this uh, this minus and minus will get a plus here and then i take the gradient outside and i take the time derivative inside so we get gradient of do phi by do t okay plus and again this minus and minus will become plus 1 by c square and this is a time derivative and here again we have a partial time derivative that will give us the second order partial time derivative with respect to t which is equal to mu not j so uh, here um, we will just uh, collect uh, this uh, this one this laplacian will collect here and uh, time derivative okay the uh, the second order derivatives will collect and the first order derivatives will collect okay separately so this is the second order derivative laplacian is a second order derivative we'll keep it here and this is a second order uh, uh, time derivative so which will which we will keep here this this is a first order derivative of uh, divergence of a and then we have here uh, a first order derivative of phi with respect to t and of course gradient is common so we can just take the common gradient outside and this is another term that we will get okay so we'll just call this as equation number 9 so this is what we have got okay equation number 8 and equation number 9 equation number 8 okay it has got phi and a here and equation number 9 it has got phi and a here but uh, if you look at these uh, these two equations they look uh, really ugly here right because you can see here they, they are not easy to solve okay they are, i mean forget about trying to solve them for that we need another kind of simplification but these two equations they look really really ugly here okay so how do we make them uh, look better okay we can do that by uh, defining uh, two more quantities okay the first quantity we call it as l okay this quantity l it's a scalar field it is simply the divergence of a plus 1 by c square the um, partial derivative of phi with respect to t in short whatever is inside this bracket okay we just refer to it as l okay and then we define another operator which is known as a d'alembertian operator okay which is uh, represented as a box which is squared and this d'alembertian operator is nothing but your, it's a combination of the laplacian and the second order time derivative okay 
सो ना यू कैन सी है लेप्लेशन वट इज लेप्लेशन कंटेन लेप्लेशन कंटेन दो स्क्वायर बाय दो एक्स स्क्वायर प्लस दो स्क्वायर बाय दो वाई स्क्वायर प्लस दो स्क्वायर बाय दो जेड स्क्वायर सो द थ्री सेकेंड ऑर्डर स्पेस डेरेवेटिव इज कंटेन हेयर एंड द टाइम डेरेवेटिव इज कंटेन ओवर हेयर सो दिस इज लाइक अ यू कोड थिंक ऑफ दिस डॉलम्बर्शन ऑपरेटर एज सम सॉर्ट ऑफ अ फोर डायमेंशनल लेप्लेशन ऑपरेटर ओके यू कोड थिंक ऑफ इट डैट वे and uh, if again because it involves the laplacian okay and the laplacian it is uh, independent of the coordinate system that we use so you could just uh, encapsulate uh, the second order um, differentiation with respect to the uh, three space coordinates you could just uh, encapsulate using this simple symbol which is called as a uh, laplacian so in cartesian coordinates this its definition will change in spherical polar coordinates its definition will change in uh, cylindrical coordinates its definition will change but overall it will perform the same function so it will hide that uh, um, coordinate system from us okay so and uh, there is already a time uh, derivative here so it means this dollem version operator also will be independent of the coordinate system okay so we can use these two this quantity this quantity l and this dollem version operator we can use these two to simplify and write these equation number 8 and 9 we can reduce these from these ugly forms we could just reduce them to two really simple and uh, elegant forms okay so this is uh, our definitions of l and the box uh, square operator the dollem version operator this is equation number 8 so what we do is in equation number 8 we add and subtract this quantity okay this equation number 8 on the left hand side we add and subtract 1 by c square dou square phi by dou t square okay so we add and subtract this quantity subtract here and add over here then you can see here uh, this laplacian operator it operates on phi and this operator this second order time derivative it also operates on phi so i can as well take the phi outside and then we get this quantity which of course you can identify right because it is nothing but your box operator and uh, over here we have ta one time derivative and this, this is a first time derivative and this is a second time derivative second order time derivative so we can just take uh, one order of time derivative outside and this will give us a divergence of a and here we will have 1 by c square do phi by do t so you can um, just make the i just identified here this is nothing but the box of square operator the dollem version operator and this quantity inside the bracket is nothing but your this quantity l okay so this is your dollem version of phi and this is the do l by do t so this gives us dollem version of phi plus do l by do t is equal to minus rho by epsilon not so this is actually much uh, easier to remember okay compared to equation number 8 it's much easier same information okay whatever information is there in equation number 8 the same information is contained over here provided you remember what is this dollem version operator and what what is this l this makes it much more elegant and simple to write now we can uh, give the same treatment to equation number 9 okay to equation number 9 also we can give the same treatment so uh, in equation number 9 very straightforward so here we have uh, this a here i can just take the a one side because this, because this is an operator and this is an operator i can take a outside here and we have a combination of these two operators and this part of course will be as it is so uh, this is equation number 9 and you can identify this is nothing but your dollem version operator again and uh, this is nothing but your l so there is a gradient outside so we have dollem version of a from this term and the second term will be the gradient of l so which will give us the dollem version of a minus gradient of l which is equal to minus mu not j so this we call as equation number 11 so the for the dynamic behavior of phi and a the potentials that we are talking about this dynamic behavior it is governed by these two equations equation number 10 and 11 so equation number 10 this is nothing so special about equation 10 and 11 i mean the, whatever information is there in equation number 8 and 9 whatever information is there in uh, these two equations okay these two equations the same equation is also contained in this two equations okay it's just that it makes it more simple and elegant uh, to express and of course you can very easily remember this equation number 9 instead of remembering this big expression you could just remember this provided of course you remember what is l and what is the dollem version operator okay so now uh, equation 10 and 11 what we have done is we have just made it uh, the expression of the equation we have just made it simpl simplified but if you look at this okay uh, we have this one 
and then we have L okay so this equation number 10 it looks like it on the surface it looks like as if it depends only on phi and equation number 11 looks like it depends only on a but actually it is not because you see even though here we have phi but you see L L contains both a and phi you see so L still contains the coupling of the scalar field and the vector field similarly we have L here so this will have the coupled terms okay so equation 10 and 11 they are still they are not uh, uncoupled okay so um, we just write this down again we equation number 8 and 9 okay same information whatever is there in 10 and 11 the same information is there in 8 and 9 okay so what have we what we have done here is uh, we have started okay, if it, uh, just you can just go back to the starting of uh, this particular section uh, this uh, the notion of these two potentials that is phi and a we got the notion of these two potentials using the uh, homogeneous Maxwell's equations and uh, these two equations which give us the dynamic behavior on, of phi and a we got from the inhomogeneous Maxwell's equations so it means all the information that is there in the Maxwell's equations is also contained in these two equations okay the only difference is the Maxwell's equations in that case you are having four um, uh, first order differential equations here we have two second order differential equations it's the information that we have reduced the number of equations here but still it, these two equations they are not easy to solve because the number of boundary conditions required to solve in both the cases whether you use the Maxwell's equations or you use these uh, potential equations the number of boundary conditions remains the same because even though the number of uh, equations has reduced from four it has become half Maxwell's equations we had four equations here we have two equations the number of equations is half but the order of the differential equations has doubled so the number of boundary conditions will remain the same in either case okay so uh, we would like to simplify these equations because if we can somehow simplify them and uh, uh, they we can make make them come into a form which is already familiar to us then uh, finding the solutions will become much straightforward okay but then there is a problem here the problem is these two equations they are still coupled to each other coupled in the sense like i am already mentioned here both these equations contain both the potentials so we would like to uncouple these two equations that is we would like one equation only in phi another equation only in a okay so how do we uncouple these equations the way to uncouple these equations is we'll use uh, the arbitrariness in the definitions of phi and a okay we will exploit the arbitrariness which exists in the definition of phi and a and using this uh, arbitrariness we will be able to uncouple these two potentials from each other okay and this method by which we use this arbitrariness and uncouple them this is known as a gauge transformation okay so which we will discuss in the next part